This is my first Timothy series, and it's an opportunity, um, as we said in chapel, to bring in someone who is actively in pastoral ministry, um, to allow him or her to preach a chapel uh, both Tuesday and Thursday, and then to respond, um, to answer your questions. Um, many of us um, are here preparing to go into the pastorate, and uh, it's a wonderful resource um, to actually talk to um, those who are doing church ministry. Um, ask questions um, about how we might be better prepared, what's waiting for us, what their experience has been. Um, and so this is a rich time. I'm really grateful to the Henry Center for hosting us and uh, for making this possible. Um, what I thought that we might do, um, again, our speaker is Reverend Glenda Simpkins Hoffman. Um, she is associate pastor at Vienna Presbyterian Church in Vienna, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and what I thought we might do is that I would ask um, two or three opening questions, just kind of get the ball rolling. And um, if you would like um, to ask her a question, um, and I hope that you will, um, would you simply just raise your hand um, and someone from the Henry Center will run a mic to you. Um, you don't need to stand up and, uh, and go to a mic. Uh, they'll, they'll actually bring one to you. Um, but let me open us up um, first with a word of prayer and then with a couple of questions for Glenda. Let's pray. Uh, God of transformation and grace, we thank you uh, for sending your people out to minister in your name, to shepherd the lost, to bind up the wounded, to proclaim your truth, that your church might move forward by the power of your spirit. Lord, we thank you uh, for your work in Reverend Glenda's life. Thank you for her call to ministry and for the ways you're using her. Lord, I ask that you speak through her today. Um, Lord, as we dialogue with her, as we ask her questions, um, that you might reveal to us our place in your kingdom, especially as it pertains to pastoral ministry. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you that you are ascending God. We love you and we praise you. May we serve you faithfully. Amen. Amen. Hey, Glenda, welcome again. Um, I was wondering if we could just start with the question. Um, could you describe to us your call to ministry and the process through which you discern that call? That's a good question. <clears throat> um, my call to ministry came when I was in college. I went to college to get an education. Um, I was going to be an English teacher and a coach. And the reason I had chosen that field is when I was in high school, those were the people that had the most influence on me. But when I got to college, I got involved in a campus ministry. And I had the wonderful joy and privilege of being discipled by people who were on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ. And that was a really life-changing time for me. It was a greenhouse growth effect on my life. And as I neared the end of my college experience, I, I really wanted to be involved in something that would make a difference in people's lives. It happened that my brother, my older brother who was in the Air Force, was actually killed in a, in a jet crash when I was a, the year, summer before my senior year in high school or, or college. And, um, and it really brought to light uh, mortality and the meaning of life. And the Lord gave me the verse, to live as Christ and to die as gain. And I had the great comfort and assurance that my brother was in the presence of the Lord. And I thought, what would it mean for me to live as Christ, live for Christ? And, um, and I really felt a call at that time to go into campus ministry. Though I have to confess, it, was, it wasn't pure motives because in some ways, I was so perfectionistic, I was afraid that I would become an excellent English teacher and coach, but I wouldn't be a very good disciple of Christ. <laughs> I was still weak in my faith. So I kind of went on staff with Campus Crusade for a year or two, and every year I would evaluate that. Um, and then after I was on staff for about seven or eight years, I really felt like the Lord was calling me to vocational ministry for life. And I didn't really know what that meant but decided to go to a seminary to be equipped further. And really through the encouragement of people in my church and people, um, my husband, who was very supportive and wanted to support me in seminary, um, I felt the call to pastoral ministry. I will say that as a woman, I had never been exposed to women in um, the pastorate. And so the thought had never occurred to me, really, had never occurred to me until I was in a Sunday school adult Sunday school class teaching and the people in that class began to say I think you have teaching gifts I think you have 
gifts for min pastoral ministry, and I thought, really? Um, and then when I was in seminary here, I, I was involved with First Pres Evanston, and uh, that's where I was ordained. And it was really there that the, the body of Christ affirmed my, my gifts for ministry and for the pastorate. And so I really feel like I was nudged forward a lot by people around me, the body of Christ, at different stages of my faith development. And that's what influenced me probably more than anything in terms yeah. of my call. Yeah, oh, I appreciate that. Having been now in ministry, pastoral ministry for 15, almost 16 years, what have been some high points and, and maybe some low points um, that stick out to you over this last decade and a half? You know, the high points for me are always um, the amazing joy and privilege it is to be involved in people's lives. As a pastor, you know, you're there at those very intimate, precious moments of life when babies are born and baptized and people are coming together to be married in weddings and in those very, very um, grief-stricken times of learning about a diagnosis of an illness, a chronic illness, a, um, grieving the death of a loved one, and just the, the, the privilege, the absolute joy of, and privilege of being able to be close to people in those moments and be a representative of Christ, it still overwhelms me. And, um, that's really the highlight for me, and just being um, a shepherd of the flock of God. I, I, love, I love God. I love the people of God. I love being able to love people in his name. And, you know, I think of all the people I've been with through 15 years of ministry, and um, I just love them. Um, the challenge of ministry, frankly, for me, I never... I never get over the fact how hard it is to really focus on making disciples in the church. <laughs> There's a lot of things in the church, a lot of systemic realities that can make it feel far more like a business than a living organism where we're about cultivating deeper relationships with God and, and cultivating deeper community with other people and equipping people to live the life of discipleship in the real world. Um, we can get distracted with a lot of stuff, and I, I just am constantly trying to evaluate and resist the temptation to that. That's probably the biggest challenge. Yeah. I've also been through some heartbreaking experiences in church. I won't go into the details about that, but, um, um, but you know, sin in people's lives is, is re a reality. Evil exists. Um, and well, I will share with this, our church Six, the church that I now serve, um, six years ago, uh, the, the, the um, youth director was found to be guilty of sexual abuse of women, young women in our church, and I was not there at the time. But the impact of that horrible evil, um, you know, it's still playing out. And this last year, it was just unfolding in new and different ways. And, um, you know, it's just... It, it's, the, the church doesn't escape the horrors of, of people's sin, and um, we have to deal with that. But the, but the good news of the gospel is the hope of healing and transformation, and, um, and I really cling to that, and I'm grateful for it. Yeah, mm, appreciate that. We, um, there, there's a sense um, that, that while we do get out in the world that um, while we're here focused in preparation for ministry, um, it's definitely possible to miss what's happening in the church. Um, I wonder, have you noticed any social, cultural trends um, in your ministry or in the folks that you're working with that are changing the way you do ministry? Mm, that's a good question. Well, I, I think not sure this is the biggest change, the biggest change, but, and I, I don't think this is new to you actually here, but <clears throat> the people that are coming to our church, I'm a, the church I belong to or am a part of is a pretty big church, so it attracts people at all stages of faith and development, a lot of people who aren't fit believers, which is good. But we just can't assume that people know anything. I mean, in terms of faith, there, there, we can't have any assumptions about what people know 
because people are shaped more by a secular, non-Christian culture more than they are a Christian culture. And I will say that that can be true for people who have even been in the church their whole lives. And, you know, even though I, I grew up as a nominal Christian, but the values that I grew up with were very Christian, even if they weren't explicitly taught that way. But that's just not true anymore. And that's a real challenge. I mean, most of the people I marry are living together already. It's, I was just talking to a couple of pastor friends. It is a rare exception to actually marry people who aren't living together. And to have to talk to them about the fact that, that they don't even know that's not normal. That's a huge difference, even from you know, 20 years ago or 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you have questions uh, for Glenda? Um, we can run mics to you. Hi, thanks for taking the time to do this. Mm -hmm. One question that I'm uh, especially considering right now is, in the matter of arming faithful leaders among the laity of the church, uh, what areas of ministry have you seen the most uh, fruitful works? For equipping the yes. saints for the work of ministry? <coughs> hmm, that's a good question. Well, I... I uh, I think that always finding ways to equip people with the Word of God, because again, don't assume that people know it, at least where the setting I'm in, and finding avenues to do that is always important. In our church, really significant ministries are Stephen Ministry, which is, I always look for things that people have already put together that are working instead of creating the will over again. So Stephen Ministry is a great way of equipping the laity and organizing our deacons and our elders to be able to do a lot of the work. We only have three pastors in a church of 2,500 people. We have a lot of directors who are supervising ministries, but we have to rely on equipping people to do the work of ministry. And so small groups are a huge emphasis in our, in our church to get people connected to each other because the pastors can't care for everybody. So equipping Stephen ministers and getting people connected to, to small groups is a really important part of their discipleship and also experiencing the love and care of God. And we find that when people do experience a crisis in their life or a grief, that those who are connected relationally to other people in the church, not necessarily to the pastors, are the ones that, make, um, that feel the most loved and cared for. Probably the ministry that's had the most significant impact in our church in terms of people really coming alive in faith is um, the Great Banquet Movement. I don't know if you know the Great Banquet or Curcio, three-day weekends. It's a, it's a renewal experience. And um, we've seen a lot of very nominal Christians or even people who don't have faith go on these, be a part of these three-day weekends. And they just, it's, they just come out with a greater vision and understanding experientially of the love of God and the grace of Christ and the power of the Spirit. And they come back and they get involved in Bible studies and small groups and they become deacons and leaders of our, and, and in a few years they've become mm -hmm. leaders of our church. Yeah. So those are a few of the things. Other questions? <coughs> Lisa. We noticed that your job description is discipleship and spiritual formation. I wondered if you could uh, distinguish the two, distinguish and relate the two. What's mm -hmm. the difference between them? How do they relate? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I think we use both terms because um, different groups of people use different words. But I would say discipleship. Um, my understanding of discipleship has changed as I've grown in my own faith and in the context of ministry where um, discipleship is helping people, mentoring people along who are at earlier stages of faith, whereas spiritual formation happens throughout the course of our lives. And um, something that's been extremely helpful to me in my own life and has, is now really impacting the way I do ministry is to understand 
that there really are two halves of life in the spiritual journey, the first half of life and the second half of life. And most ministries in the church, which I would say have to do with discipleship, are organized around the first half of life, helping people accumulate knowledge and experiences, discovering their strengths and skills for ministry, and, and, and helping them. Much like children and youth and adolescents are growing and getting to know themselves and growing in, in faith. Um, but the second half of life is really about not accumulating necessarily more information and more experiences, but allowing it to settle more deeply into our lives and into our hearts and souls. And that involves a whole other set of practices and realities. And the relationship between the church and the relationship um, to, to uh, different practices, it, it's just a different kind of experience. So I don't know if that answers the question the way And I, I do want to say that spiritual formation is a process of becoming more like Christ for the sake of others. I mean, it is a process of being transformed into likeness of Christ. And, um, and I think sometimes, like I said, the challenge of the church in conveying the message to people that in the church that what we're really about is becoming like Christ, living like Christ, serving in the world as Christ's representatives. And there are various stages of faith, and in, in, in what that looks like at those stages is different for different people. And the church, it's important that we provide multiple opportunities for, for that to happen. Yeah. Back. Um, hi, my name is Michelle. I just want to say thanks for sharing earlier today. Thank and um, one thing you had mentioned in chapel, you're speaking on the Gospel of Mark in how um, the disciples in, in, that, in that time were um, healing the sick and casting out demons and the Pharisees were focused on, what about this law and why aren't they following this? And my question, I guess, is how much do you see that same spirit and that same yeah. attitude of thinking filter into the church today and even how we're training up new leaders and new pastors or making disciples that we're focusing so much on the pharisaical attitude that we're missing mm -hmm. doing the greater works that Jesus has called us to do in forming disciples in that way. More than we want, more than I want to admit. <laughs> I see it more than I care to admit. You know, it really depends on the context. I mean, I do think, I do think, and I, I find this, I, I don't point the, peep, the, the finger because I just feel like I daily have to resist being a Pharisee, you know, and focusing on the wrong thing, focusing on doing things right versus um, doing what's needed and, and the loving thing. And uh, so I, it really depends on the context and, and every situation. I, don't, I, I can't speak more broadly than our own church, really, and, um, and the larger denomination that I'm a part of, maybe, that. I think we can focus on the wrong questions. We can ask the wrong questions instead of what is it that helps us become more like Christ? What is it that is needed to express the love of Christ? Often the right question isn't what's the right thing to do, but what's the loving thing to do? And, and there's a great temptation. I think it's part of our fallen human sinful condition to rely on our own human striving our own knowledge, our own ability, our own skills, as opposed to letting go and trusting the grace of Christ and the power of the Spirit. And I, I don't think we'll ever totally get away from that temptation, but, but that's what spiritual formation is, is being transformed to such a degree that more and more, I love what Dallas Willard says, I, discipleship is learning to live my life as Jesus would live it if he were me. Learning to live my life as Jesus would live it, as he were me, if he were me. And being free to be a conduit of his love and grace and power. You had a question over here. You know, uh, in our generation, it seems like the issue of women in ministry, or I don't know if you say call it an issue, the topic of women in ministry. Um, is becoming much more uh, something that the church is having to engage. 
um, in the past that they it predominantly has kind of shunned that. Um, so I'm curious, because I know a lot of the, even my background as a coming from a very conservative evangelical background, a very complementarian, um, the concept of women in ministry, of course, if they go into a ministry, they have to end up at a liberal mainline church. And they have to, you know, drop all, you know, standards and or whatever. And that's, you know, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that's where I'm at now. No, <laughs> I, hey. All right, all right. You, I know what you're talking my, about. My question is, in relation to a woman who's ordained and in ministry and went through the process, that process, what has that journey looked like? And have you felt like it has been a, like, there aren't a lot of options in, in that regards, where you can serve? And even, you know, what does that look like? Have you had to, at times, step back and be quiet about certain things that you have personal convictions about? Um, yes. <laughs> My journey has been an interesting one because even in the setting in Campus Crusade where I was really nurtured in my faith in Campus Crusade for Christ at the time, there was a hierarchical structure where, with male leadership and women could only be like associates or assistant directors and such. So, and, and like I said, I grew up in a setting where I had never even seen a woman pastor. So, I mean, I remember when I was younger and I was pretty spiritual thinking, maybe I should be a nun or a pastor's wife. I mean, literally, that's, that's like what I thought the options were. And it wasn't until I became a part of a very dynamic Presbyterian church that, by the way, didn't have any women pastors, but I was teaching, and they, as I shared earlier, um, people started to say, I think you have gifts for pastoral ministry. I never, ever thought of that on my own. It was the body of Christ. And I, and I will tell you that when I was serving with Campus Crusade for Christ, I did some serious soul reflection and study on the Word of God um, to understand those passages that are, are problematic and, and, and cause people to uh, think of, you know, have different interpretations about what women can do. And, you know, obviously I came to the conclusion that um, in Christ there's freedom. Freedom, and, and I will share with you that, that I come from a family, my husband's in a family, that really are conservative and don't believe in women in ministry. And so I was really going against the grain, not just of the culture, the ministry environment I was in, but family culture too, but there was, a, a, again, the body of Christ I was a part of and this inner conviction that, that I had to be true to who Christ created me to be and who Christ called me to be, and to do what he called me to do to be faithful. And it was, there was a lot of resistance, external resistance. Um, I, I am in a liberal mainline denomination, but the truth of the matter is, or what's considered that, every, every Presbyterian church, PCUSA church I belong to, has been a very conservative, evangelical, you know, spirit-filled, life-affirming <laughs> um, church. And, and, and so I do consider myself an evangelical. And I do think sometimes our denomination, we were talking about this earlier, our denominations made some decisions that I don't agree with. And I often think, where will I go as an evangelical woman? There aren't a lot of options for me. And I'm in a covenant group with other evangelical women. We're like, what are we going to do? But, you know, I thought, I don't know, you know, I don't know, but God knows the future. And, and so that is a question I think about, because I, I am concerned about being faithful to Christ and following his calling, and I'm concerned about, and I'm, well, I don't know if my, the denomination I'm a part of will even be around in a couple decades. I know the Church of Jesus, Jesus Christ will be, is alive and well and will be until he comes again and that he has a place for me in that. And I don't know what it is, maybe, in the future. But I'm sure as <laughs> I never would have imagined three decades ago I'd be where I am. So he'll get me where he wants me to go. Thanks for the question, though. Good stuff. Other questions for Glenda? Linda, many, many of our students will go into an associate role. Could you comment mm. a little bit about uh, the unique challenges yeah. and opportunities that come from being uh, an associate pastor? <laughs> so, 
That is a great question. <laughs> that is a great question. I need a minute to think about it. <laughs> Actually, I have to be honest. Um, I like being associated in some ways, in a lot of ways, because you don't have a lot of the buck stops here stuff, and I get to, I'm more free to do relational ministry. <laughs> it's also frustrating, because I don't preach as much, and I really do enjoy preaching. And um, there is a tremendous amount of power in, in a senior pastor position, especially in a large church. And um, in some ways, I, and that's just the way it is. And in some ways, I'm really grateful that I don't have that kind of power in a senior pastor position. Sometimes it's really frustrating. Um, but I think, I, I, let me think. I think the thing I would share most about an associate role is I think my biggest struggle in, as an associate, particularly in my first church, was having high expectations of my leader. Too high expectations. That tends to be my, my uh, tendency anyway. And I think it's really important to view the people around us that we work with in leadership positions and understand we're all human and we're all pilgrims on the journey. And just because a person's in a certain position it's important to not place too high expectations on them, or un maybe I shouldn't even say high expectations, yes, but unrealistic expectations, no. And, um, and just to realize there is, there is a reality about being an associate that is, is real, and you need to accept it. And the great gift of being an associate, though, is we have the opportunity to share an ethos or an alternative style of ministry that sometimes the person in a senior pastor position really doesn't have the opportunity to do because so much attention is focused on that role. And not only do maybe fellow colleagues have high expectations, but everybody in the congregation does too. So it's really to know, your, to know that person and build a relationship and learn to trust and respect them and support them in their vision and calling and to really be careful not to triangulate with the congregation and to, 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 to realize that in ministry, you know, those relationships in a, a, a leadership team um, are so key for cultivating the trust and respect for each other. And that really influenced the whole dynamic of the congregation. So. Yeah. I know we had some other questions right in the middle there, too. My question's kind of in regards to what you talked on this morning. You know, you made that, that great point about how uh, our faith isn't legalistic, how it's not about living up to these this set of laws that we have to do. Um, and I've, I've seen some of that in the Presbyterian church that I serve at, some of that mindset with the kids that I work with. Uh, but on the other side of the spectrum, there's also those who think that there's nothing involved in this relationship, that, uh, that it should just come to them because they believe. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about that tension, about how to how to disciple uh, both kids and adults um, on both sides so that they realize that it is a relationship and it does require action on our part, but it's not about following a set of rules, not about how much I pray, it's not about how much I read my Bible. Mm -hmm. Sure. Them. You know, I love, I think, I don't know if it's Richard Foster or Dallas Willard says, I love this phrase, grace is not opposed to effort. <clears throat> it's opposed to earning. And so, the life of discipleship, and I'll be talking about this on Thursday, the life of discipleship requires a lot of effort. You know, just like any relationship. I mean, I think most people sometimes when they think about the spiritual life, they just put it in a totally different category than everything else in their life. You know, it's like you're not going to have a meaningful friendship or relationship with your girlfriend, boyfriend, or spouse if you don't put a little time and effort into it. And that's true for the relationship with God. We're not going to be become the kind of people who can do what Jesus would do, love as Jesus would love, serve as Jesus would serve, if we don't have some training. I mean, people don't become excellent tennis players, piano, play, uh, piano pianists, or um, speak a foreign language without some training. And that's what discipleship involves, training. Training so that 
that my son is learning to play the piano. And he's, he's really a gifted, smart kid, so he's frustrated. He's, fr he's like this. He's like this. He's like, I can't play the piano. He's eight. I'm like, you can't play the piano? No, I can't play the piano. I'm like, because you can't sit down and play like a concert pianist, you can't play the piano. I said, no, you have to train yourself to become like that. And I was having a conversation about, you know, muscle memory. You have to develop your muscle memory through playing scales and practicing over and over again until your impulse is that you will be able to play. And if you do that, someday you'll be able to. And the same is true of discipleship. Same is true of cultivating a relationship with God. We become formed into the character of Christ as we practice spiritual disciplines. Disciplines aren't something we do to become what we want to become. I use the illustration with my congregation. My, uh, my approach to disciplines of prayer and worship and study early in my life were like rowing. You know, it was like, I'm getting, doing this to get where I need to go in the spiritual life. Some people have the expectation that, hey, once I put my, place in, my faith in Christ, it's like climbing on a pontoon boat or a cruise ship. It's like, hey, now I'm, <laughs> now I'm floating. There's nothing else. I can relax and enjoy the ride. But our life in Christ is like sailing. And anyone who's sailed knows that I don't personally sail, but I've been with friends who do. They're very busy, very active. There's things they have to do to cooperate with the wind. The water holds them up, and um, the bolt ho boat holds them in, and the power of the Spirit blows. But there's things we have to do to cooperate with the wind. And that's what's true of the spiritual life in a relationship with God. Good question. Speaking for those who have families, um, do you have any practical words of wisdom or secret in balancing or prioritizing ministry and family? That's a great question. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I confess, this has been a really hard one for me, but I did hear early in my ministry, this, um, this was really helpful to me. Um, the synod I was a part of provided this um, twice a year retreat for two years for new pastors. And at one of these retreats, one of the leaders said, if you're giving more than 50 hours a week to ministry, then something in your life is giving. Your relationship with God, your family life, your mental health, your physical well-being, something will be given, you know, will we'll start taking its toll. Now, I, I have to say, I didn't hold to that pattern early in my ministry. I didn't have kids for quite a few years while I was first in ministry, but my husband paid the price for it, sadly. Um, but I've learned in life that this is something you have to accept about ministry. It is never done. It doesn't matter how hard you work or how much you accomplish. There's always another need to be met, another task to be done. I mean, it's true in life, too, in any work, but it's especially true in ministry. But you think, oh, but these people need this, or this needs to be done. This is important. And I've just learned that you have to draw the line somewhere. And if you draw it at 50 hours or 90 hours, there's still going to be more to be done. And so I just try to live, and I'm not, I have to be honest, I'm not always as good at it as I wish I were. But I, I'm trying to believe that God doesn't give me more to do than I can do. Other people may do that. I may do that to myself. But God understands human limits. We are not super people. We're not superhuman people. We are creatures. We're always creatures. Even if we're Christians, we're still creatures. And we have real limits. And to live within those limits, to live within those boundaries, will, I believe, make us more effective ministers. It was actually when my children were born a year after my, or my first child, after we adopted our first child, I realized how excessive I had been in working more hours than I should have. And uh, I started to make the adjustment because my baby needed me. And I realized that there's a great distinction between being productive 
busy and productive and being faithful and fruitful. And I decided I want to live my life to be faithful and fruitful. And that will have a greater impact on the kingdom of God than all my busy human striving. So. And as a teaser, I think your sermon on Thursday goes wades into some of these mm -hmm. waters mm -hmm. a little too. So. Yeah. Linda, question for you. Um, could you just describe some of the uh, spiritual practices that in your own inner life help you to thrive and flourish and maybe how that's changed? You know, you're talking about the two halves of life mm -hmm. and how, how, wherever you are on that yeah. continuum, how, how it's changed over the years. But what is it that, that helps you to thrive? That's a great question. Thanks. Um, you know, early in my life, early in the first half of life, and, you know, certainly in seminary, studying the Word of God and praying and worshiping and the classic spiritual disciplines were absolutely critical um, to my spiritual life. And they're still very much a part of the practices that I do. Um, I don't think you can be a Christian without being nourished with the Word. And, but my understanding of prayer has changed a lot. You know, I used to think of prayer as intercession. And it was a, a practice that I did. And... Now I think of prayer as, as more of a way of being with God. And so I practice more contemplative forms of prayer. And I find those to be helpful to me right now. Um, I am a real Sabbatarian. I practice Sabbath. And I make sure that I do that to remind myself of my humanness, my limits my limited capacity, that I need to rest, I need to stop my work, and be confident that even when I stop, God continues to work. And that is a critical practice in my ministry. And I've told people that I supervise on my staff, I will come into your ministry and I will help you decide what you need to stop doing. But I will not be satisfied if you are not taking Sabbath, because that it's not a legalistic command. I mean, I know Jesus dealt with the legalism of Sabbath keeping, but it's a gift to be received and to be enjoyed. And so that's a big one for me. And then just the practices of silence and solitude. I, I find that, that, again, these disciplines can often become things that we're doing and spinning up along with all the other things that we're doing. But just taking regular time for retreat to go away um, especially as ministers, I think. So much of our ministry involves words. It involves um, dialoguing. And so to, 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 to stop that, to stop talking, to, so I'm talking incessantly, <laughs> to stop talking and to be silent and to maintain this posture of listening, I think is so critical. It is for me. And then also to just go into times on a regular basis quarterly is a good rhythm for me to just have a day or even a couple of days where I don't, I don't read, I don't have an agenda. I just go into that time to be with God and to listen with God. And I find that even though there may be things that are stirring in my life, that it's when I cultivate that space that I really hear God and receive a new direction or a word that I need for my life and my ministry at that time. Thanks for the question. We probably have time for one more. James, up here. Um, I have kind of one question with three parts. Uh, <laughs> I can oh, remember. Who yeah. knows me is not surprised right now. Uh, from your talk this morning, uh, especially one of your last points, it seemed very clear that you have a strong passion for youth in the church and especially with the pressures and expectations that they have on them to perform. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about some strategies to help combat this. But the three parts that I see the church have a responsibility for three different areas here. One, how do we speak to and comfort and encourage children or youth or young adolescents to live free of those expectations and live into God's expectations, but I think also you know, we have their parents in our congregations as well who are part of the problem with the expectations and the demands being put on them. So how do we work with parents as well to change expectations? And also with the parents and even you know, anyone who just came out of a seminary or any other grad school, you have people who are maybe single or 
um, not parents, but are still these broken adults now, living with this demand and expectation to perform. So you kind of have three fronts you're fighting this on. If you can talk mm -hmm. about what are strategies we the church can do to, to work towards mm -hmm. healthy expectations and living in the freedom of the parents. I, I think the biggest thing the biggest thing we can do is preach from our pulpits the gospel of grace. And that's what I was talking about early when we first started, is to say we cannot make any assumptions. People do not get this. And at some levels, I don't even still get it. It's a mystery. It's an amazing reality. I can tell you, I could tell you 30 years ago about grace, but every year I keep understanding it more fully. And so I think we have people in all these different stages of faith and we cannot stop lifting up what grace really is. And I like Dallas Willard's, I'm a Dallas Willard fan, can you tell me? Um, his, his definition of grace, that it's, it's, you know, sometimes we talk about grace as, as the way that we get forgiveness of sins so we can go to heaven. But I like the definition, grace is a God accomplishing for you what you cannot accomplish for yourself. And to, be, to lift up the vision that there, is, there are a lot of things in life, all of life is meant to be dependent on the grace of God to help us do what we can accomplish for ourselves. And then we have to lift up the realities and name the cultural realities for what it is. And I'll say that sermon that I preached, the most comments I probably got on any sermon I've preached at Vienna was that line that I felt said that... Um, that, that youth are being fed, you know, a lie straight from the pit of hell. I mean, I got a lot of comments on that, and I said, because that's true, and we need to say it for what it is, and, and help people realize that this idea, especially, you know, you gotta, you gotta do this, 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 and this, so you'll get into the right college, and da 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 da, -da and it's all up to you, and I mean, we just have to say that, that is not the good news of Jesus Christ and the gospel of grace. And so I think that's true whether you're working with students, um, their parents, or single people, you know, to just help people understand and live more and more into grace. And so that's why these practices, this is why it's so critical in our day and age to incorporate the, the disciplines of detachment. The disciplines of detachment help us to stop our human striving to become aware of the ways we're striving so that we can rely more and more on God's grace. People say, I can't be silent for 15 minutes. It's like, then you better practice. You better practice. I can't be alone. Then you better practice. I can't observe Sabbath. I've got too much to do. Well, start, do what you can, not what you can. Start, start arranging an hour or two a week that you would practice Sabbath, because these disciplines make us aware, our failure to practice these disciplines make us aware of the ways we're relying on ourselves, our own busyness, our own doing. And, and so I, again, I think whether you're our youth to try to, you know, churches are the worst about making Sundays the busiest day of the week. I mean, as a pastor, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Stop the craziness, you know? Organize your church and cultivate space for people to be alone with God, to be together as a family, to enjoy the gift of life as it was meant to be lived. Read every book you can on Sabbath. Live it. Talk about it. Get pe other people to, to have the vision of this is the reality of the life of grace. A life that I can stop the craziness and receive the gift of God's goodness. And that's one way to do it. It's a small way. But if people can start living Sabbath, they'll have a lot of other opportunities to practice other disciplines, and they'll get a taste, a taste of heaven and the joy of just being a beloved child and not having to work so hard. So I don't know if that. Hey, Glenda, thank you. Thank you very much.